Yeah, I would say when I started first exploring outside of the computer in physical mediums, uh, the first step is actually a pen plotter from the 80s uh, that just controlled a pen. It's before we had laser printers and inkjet printers. There were these pen plotters that also the computer artists in the 60s were using and in the 80s it was for drawing CAD or architectural drawings and they're still programmable today. You can still move the pen and that was an initial step where I said, wow, this image that it produces is something completely different than what I see on the screen because if the pen goes twice over one spot, it's richer and deeper there. Um, and so that's something I've explored and played with, but have maybe yet to really hang uh, and say, this is the artwork. I would say the audience is very important. Um, for one reason, I'm very happy playing with this in my studio and having been the only audience, that's also um, satisfying for me. So the audience doesn't need to be there, but when I decide to put it out and share it, then they very much need to be a part of it. Uh, because, yeah, otherwise, why should I leave the studio? And in this regard, that's often why I try to bring an interactive element into it so that the, the visitor can participate in the work, whether it be a direct interaction uh, where they're controlling some parameters and in, in influencing the work, to in this particular piece, the, their body, their movement playing a role and then becoming a part of the work almost in a slightly more passive way. Thermal Photo Booth Band is sort of the latest iteration of a exploration for, I would say, the last six years uh, when friends first introduced me to this thermal printer that we're used to at the cash register when we buy groceries. And I was amazed by how fast it could print. It only heats the paper, so it's 80 meter rolls of paper uh, that can be instantly printed out. At the very beginning, I started playing with loops, just using a piece of paper, a piece of tape, and testing what happens if we overprint, overprint, and started at the same time to make photo booths. Because it's such a fast image out, I thought that it lended itself quite well to a visitor exploring their vanity, exploring the translation of their image into this medium with pixels or previously with type. And after a few iterations of making these photo booths, then I came back to the idea of loop and was interested. What happens when this is a long loop? This, this paper roll is 80 meters long, so it has the potential of, of documenting history of the visitors. And so that final iteration, um, or the la latest iteration, played at the stairwell of our institute at the Hochschule Stadtenkunst. And there, over seven floors, it was possible to take that piece of paper and wrap it all the way around, tape it, and then through the magic of physics and a little pulley, I was surprised at how, how nicely the paper could freely spin. And so I set up a kiosk where visitors could come and leave their mark, they could take a picture, and eventually with time you get the overlaps of pictures, and if it had been there long enough, then I imagine the paper would eventually turn black or you'd get all sorts of interesting overlaps of the person's face. Yeah, that particular work uh, I showed for an in, uh, open house day. So it had been in development in my studio. I tried it horizontally and found gravity to be a problem and had been applying a few times to try and show it in a, in a constellation where I play with what the, the loop of paper is, but it hadn't been picked up for these applications, and so I showed it at an open house. And after the open house was over, I cut the printer and the computer out of the loop, taped it back together, and then it became a really interesting um, sort of conveyor belt that people could explore for the next weeks of the history that had happened from that day. So that was also an interesting 
aspect. It doesn't have to continue producing new content on the paper. It could also sit there as a record, an interactive record of what happened that day. So the project isn't as far from over. Uh, it's been a little sidestepped from my exploration to oscilloscopes, but I have interest to come back to it and to explore what also sculptural properties can this loop of paper have and what other contents should go onto this printed matter. Is it a photo booth? Is it uh, also playing with the body in a similar way to how we are now? Or many other contents that could go onto this, this long loop. interesting to see how people interact with the works, particularly ones that involve a camera. In some way it's exploiting the fact that we love, we, we have this inherent quality of a mirror and seeing ourselves and what, what do we look like in this medium, but what I'm particularly interested in is the translation of that self-portrait into another medium, into another mode of representation. So it's not just the, the picture of them directly, but in these, these particular works, it's the translation of their body to a single contour line. And so people come up and I, it's, it's great to see them move and they can recognize themselves in this translation, but it's a different image than they're used to. They never see this in the mirror. And through this thermal printer, it's also a certain low resolution, high contrast, black and white pixels, where you see yourself, but it's through a obscured, abstracted form. And so even though it's a photo booth, you still capture yourself in a mode you're not used to. So that's also great that it surprises the, the visitor and they take pictures maybe differently or more often or in different, they, they end up manipulating themselves to the visualization that they see and therefore are forced to react to how they're being captured. Yeah, with projected book movements, this falls a bit more towards the, I would say, design side in that it's a data visualization. It's taking place at Siderwerk where they have this rich library collection uh, with RFID tags and a robot that keeps track of the position of the books at any time. So there's a history of where the books move to and where they sit freely on the shelf. And this particular piece was uh, spending a week in there playing with the data and visualizing via projector over the books those movement histories. In that particular case, I believe I'm using a found audio, um, where if I'm not generating the audio myself, I'm trying to find open source, creative common music that is connected in a way to, to the video or the content of the video. Uh, in the last couple of years, my own work has been exploring more and more generating audio on its own uh, because coming from coding visuals it was always music was the the initiator or you're reacting with visuals to an audio track in a sense of a vj and slowly it shifted where the visuals generate audio to in this latest work with oscilloscopes the visual is the audio it's about as close as i've finally been able to come where the two have a completely symbiotic relationship that I have an image because I have sound. I'm sending sound to these devices to get an image and therefore when I make the sound audible and play with it in pitches, I'm getting both a soundtrack and a visual and they are the exact same thing. They're completely dependent on each other. Whereas in other works, I may be generating audio that I think fits the visual and is influenced from the visual but isn't necessary to the visual. Yeah, Formbit began with uh, my first exploration into three-dimensional forms through code, and right at about the same time, 
uh, an opportunity came up to do a residence for an audiovisual generative work at the immersive lab in Zurich. And there they have this fantastic research project with four 270 degree interactive touch walls and the works that were commissioned had to play with this touch capability. And so there I decided these three-dimensional forms I'm making could be created by enabling the user to touch the points for such a form. And then I do what I call poor man's 3D. I take that path and revolve it in 360 degrees. So then we have a form, I call it. And then this form orbits. It speeds up in different, it slowly goes faster and faster in one direction. It's moving towards and away from the user in the z-axis. And there's always two of these forms at any given time. So when someone makes a new form, it erases the older of the two. And through this interaction, they play the crucial role of what do we see. They're generating the forms. They're doing this translation from a sort of 2D design or enfurf, uh, like a sort of, yeah, a test design to it becoming the work and then they have the choice if they tap tap and constantly test new forms or once they've made their forms they sit back and and can watch it infinitely because these two forms are always at different speeds different positions and our view into the forms creates a composition constantly this this surprising moments of how close or far are they how fast are they moving um, will always be different and in this case, I was playing with the sound from the image. So I'm analyzing the image, I'm checking how bright are parts of the screen, depending how many speakers I have. And that gives me one signal. It's, it's so bright here, therefore the audio should be so loud on that speaker. And the sound is manipulated through how fast are the things rotating, how close or far are they from us. And it was the first time uh, that I could create and generate sound that I was satisfied with that was really coming from the work where yeah the work generated sound versus reacting to sound and so it's now been in three different iterations there was the first iteration four projectors 16 channels of audio touch screen and then it was shown two years ago at Regionale where then I built a three wall projection version and because I didn't have a touch wall I switched to a tablet and enabled the the visitor to make their designs in front of them and then see them grow and, and fill the space. And the current version number three at L6 uses one projector, this tablet, but now for the first time the image isn't held within the wall, it also is allowed to go onto the floor and the ceiling. And although it's less projection, less surrounding, I feel this one also has a quite interesting three-dimensional quality to it just from breaking the wall space which before I think I was being very safe and saying yep the image sits on the wall we walk on the floor and in this piece through it sort of breaking that boundary uh, I'm finding quite interesting three-dimensional illusions that take place as these forms revolve. bit I want the audience to both explore this system that I've created this structure it's sort of a I don't want to call it a tool I want to call it an experience that then they get to explore the rules of that experience so the first time they touch it it will be very foreign why am I touching this thing what did that do and I get to experience when I watch people play with it after about three or four designs they get exactly what's happening and then it becomes their curiosity and exploration. Ah, I tried this, why don't I try this? Experiencing, what did that do? Okay, maybe I should try this instead. And they slowly, yeah, are, are getting to explore their own creativity and uh, curiosity at the same time as their, their two-dimensional design pattern um, path becomes the artwork and they get to then sit back and enjoy what those two forms mean over each other. I've also had the feedback, why does it have to be interactive? Why can't it entertain me and be completely generative and do its own thing? And I can understand that argument that 
that's also a question for me in terms of interaction. Do I want pieces to happen and the person watches it and doesn't have to participate, but it's participating for them? Or do I want to give them an influence on the work? And at the moment, I'm still leaning towards the letting them have an influence so that they can feel more connected to it, they can shape it and become a part of it. I would say the majority of these works start from a late night sketch, testing something out or a train ride, programming no internet is about the most productive you could be and testing something out. It could be just a simple little sketch that then somehow hooks you and you invest more and more time into it and it gets more complex. And then a certain opportunity maybe brings it to finding a, a deeper realization. In the case of Formbit, it was just playing what are 3D points in space rotating. The first iteration was audio reactive. I thought this could be a great visualization to music and then the opportunity came up for an audio-visual generative work, which meant it should make its own audio, it should be interactive. This is the possible output. With the oscilloscope works, I was infinitely curious how to draw onto these oscilloscopes. And then through particular installation possibilities, that helped me evolve how should I take the work into a final piece. Uh, become sketches, I test things out. What does it mean if I take the body and mix it with type? What does it mean if I mix the body with another shape? And eventually those then find their way into the final piece. In my own process, I'm particularly working in processing as the majority of my, my tool. It's a simplified version of Java that was designed for artists and designers to get into code. And I find it a perfect sketching tool that it can do almost everything I've needed to do. Rarely do I need to step up to a, a more capable um, programming environment. And it enables both the very fast sketching, trying something out, to the final installation that can control four different signals of sound, visual. that the viewer after experiencing these pieces is also expanding some aspect of what they accept as art. This has this technological code heavy side and sometimes media art gets a slight separation from the other arts. I think it's less and less and there's not a reason to fight and say, hey, let it play with the others. Um, but I think this work hopefully explores contemporary possibilities through our digital tools combined with older technologies. I like to call this new and newer media because these devices, everything used to be new media. Paint was a new media. Uh, today we have newer media. And I think in my work, I really enjoy exploring both of these, sort of talking to older new media with even newer media and seeing what new possibilities can we pull out of those machines, out of those aesthetics. You can find more projects from me on my website teddavis.org. Uh, I'm teaching full-time at the Hochschule Gestalten Kunst in the Institute for Visual Communication. So you can also find work of my students where I'm teaching them these sort of practices, creative coding. I get, I'm fortunate to get to teach courses in Glitch and Processing and Bazel.js programming and InDesign. And regularly in our thesis and open houses, we try to exhibit the works that those students create.